Listen, I have a word um, for us this morning. This is something I'm really excited about to share with us. And uh, the title of, of the talk this morning is titled, Where Are the Midwives? Where are the midwives? This is a message that I believe uh, will stir your spirit. Um, I believe you're going to get really uh, excited, really passionate. Uh, I believe you're going to feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Um, I believe it's going to open your eyes to how much God really does love you and how much God really wants to use you in the earth. I believe it's going to open your eyes uh, for you to realize that you have purpose here in this life. And God's got something big and amazing on his mind for you. And not just for you, but how God wants to use you to help uh, birth something, to help, to help deliver something through somebody else. And so we're going we're gonna to talk about this this morning. Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1, we're going to go there. Um, Exodus chapter 1, verse 6, reading out of the New Living Translation. So I'll give you a second to turn there with your techie devices or your Bibles. It's in the Old Testament. Uh, we're going to start in verse 6. And it reads this. It says, in time, Joseph and all of his brothers died, ending that entire generation. So if you remember the story of Joseph, the coat of many colors, his dad Jacob, his dad Jacob really loved Joseph, and he favored him with this coat. Brothers got jealous, threw him into a pit. He went from a pit to, uh, to, to serving uh, in Potiphar's house, from Potiphar's house to prison, from prison to second in command over Egypt. And uh, God got him to the place that, that he intended for Joseph to be, uh, but he went through a journey. Well, this is at the end now uh, of Joseph's life in verse 6. It says, in time, Joseph and all of his brothers died. So Joseph and all of his brothers have, uh, has, has, they passed. It says, ending that entire generation. But their descendants, the Israelites, had many children and grandchildren. Uh, their descendants, uh, the Israelites, had many children and grandchildren. In fact, they multiplied so greatly that they became extremely powerful and filled the land. I've got some good news for us this morning. God wants us to multiply, and he's, he's uh, given us the power of the Holy Spirit, and he wants us to feel the land. He told Adam and, Adam and Eve, he said, multiply, man. Go and multiply. So God wants us to produce. He wants us to multiply. This life is just not about you. It's not just about me. It's not just about me and what God's called me to do. It's about helping you fulfill what God has called you to do. Come on, where are the midwives? Keep that in mind. Eventually, verse 8, a new king came to power in Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph or what he had done. So this new king knows nothing about Joseph, knows nothing about um, how God used Joseph to interpret a dream, uh, to help in the seven years of plenty, and then also the seven years of famine. And, uh, and so th this new king knows nothing about Joseph, all right? And, uh, and it says in verse 9, he said to his people, look, the people of Israel now outnumber us and are stronger than we are. So what, is, what, what does the king say? Look, the people of Israel now outnumber us and are stronger than we are. Pay attention to this because we're, we're going to hit on uh, something else, just, uh, uh, not just the midwives part. We're going to hit on uh, another nugget here. All right. So look, the people of Israel now outnumber us and are stronger than we are. This is what the king's thinking. He says, we must make a plan to keep them from growing even more. If we don't, and if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us. Then they will escape from the country. I have a little note here in the bottom of my Bible. Maybe you do too. But it says, or we'll take the country. They'll escape the country or they'll take the country. I just want to stop right here for a moment and speak into something really, really important. I want to talk into what the spirit of fear does if we do not get a hold of the spirit of fear in our life. King Pharaoh, he had this new king. He sees that the Israelites are growing and they're powerful. And instead of linking arms with the Israelites, God's chosen people, he allows fear to enslave him. And because now he's enslaved with feel, fear, King Pharaoh moves into control. Fear is easy to force us into controlling other things. If we don't get control over the spirit of fear in our life, then it's going to be easy for us to control other things and other people in our life. 
because we're not focused on God using uh, God, God helping us and delivering us with the spirit of fear, what we'll do is we'll project this fear now onto other things and onto other people. And what King Pharaoh maybe should have done was find a leader in the Israelites, link arms with them, and see what God would want to do. Just an idea. Maybe that's a terrible game plan, but it's a thought that came to mind. But instead, what he does, he allows fear. Remember, remember how it says here a couple times, one very specifically, it says a key word. This word is a two-letter word. Write it down. It says, if, if, fear is the dominator of if. Fear brings out what, what if I get in a car wreck today? What if this plane crashes? What if I get COVID-19? What if my parents do and they die? What if my so-and-so dies from such and such? What if my marriage falls apart? If, 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 what if, what, that's what fear says. Fear is big for the what if. I bet you there's, there's plenty of us who have dealt with the what if. Man, what if, what if my call does not come to pass? What if, what if my children do not reach their God-given purpose? Man, what if my finances tank during this season? There's so many what ifs. And here you've got King Pharaoh saying, if, if, what is that fear? If, let's look at it again. If war breaks out, they will join. If. So fear is putting this thought in King Pharaoh's mind of if war breaks out, if war breaks out, they will join our enemies. They will join. How does he know they'll join their enemies? They will join our enemies and fight against us. Then they will take over the country. See, fear puts this image in our mind that is not true. And you've probably heard it before, just like I have. Fear and faith are the same thing. Fear is believing in something negative to happen. Faith is believing something that God says will happen. Faith is believing God's word. Fear is believing lies of the devil. That's what fear is. So it's really important that whenever you find yourself wanting to control a situation, control somebody, control your finances, when you sit on your wallet versus giving it to the Lord, when you're trying to control your marriage because you're afraid it's going to fall apart, when you're controlling your kids because you're afraid they're going to rebel and turn against you, all the, the one thing that that may do the most is just drive your marriage more apart, drive your kids more away. So what we have to do is take a step back and trust the Lord with whatever it is that is concerning to us. Don't allow fear to enslave you and then push you into a control freak. There's a lot of control freaks in the body of Christ. I mean, there's a lot of control freaks in the world, but come on, there's a lot of control freaks in the church. A lot of pastors want to control their members. A lot of church members want to control their pastor. A lot of church people trying to control other church people. Man, a lot of church people trying to control the lost people. You got lost people trying to control the church. There's a lot of control happening in the world, and the root of control is fear. Fear is what drives control. Manipulation. Fear is what drives manipulation. We have to manipulate. We have to, we have to distort. We got to pervert to get our way, to make sure things go our way. Here you have King Pharaoh. He's, he's being enslaved and empowered by fear. So what does he do? Now we're going to enslave the Israelites. We're going to control the Israelites. This is exactly what's happened during this COVID-19 era. The enemy has used COVID-19 to enslave people to fear. And now, now you've got people, you've got, you've got different people trying to control people and, and, and whatever else that it's trying to, whatever else they're trying to control. So really, really important to understand what fear does to us. Fear makes people miserable. Let's, let's dive in a little deeper and see what fear, how fear has played out and how it's impacted the Israelites. It says this in verse 11. So the Egyptians made the Israelites their slaves. The Egyptians made the Israelites their slaves. What really made the Israelites slaves? Fear that was in King Pharaoh. The demon of fear that was in King Pharaoh is now what has put the Israelites in a position where they're controlled. Now, you could also ask, why didn't the Israelites rise up in power? I don't know. But I do know this, though. I do know the Lord did prophesy and say that his kids were going to be in bondage. And so this is the fulfillment of this word. They appointed brutal slave drivers over them, hoping to wear them down with crushing labor. 
with crushing labor. One of the things fear does, it puts unrealistic expectations. When we are driven by fear and now we want to control somebody else, we put unrealistic expectations on whoever else we're trying to control. So here we have here, the appointed, they appointed brutal slave drivers over them, hoping to wear them down with crushing labor. They forced them to build the cities of uh, Pithom and Ramses as supply centers for the king. But the more the Egyptians oppressed them, the more, listen to this, I, you need to hear what this verse says. This is the word of God. This is the Bible. Listen to this. But the more the Egyptians oppressed the Israelites, the more the Israelites multiplied and spread, and the more alarmed the Egyptians became. I want to debunk a myth that just because you may feel like you're being controlled by government right now. Just because, that wasn't an internet issue, I just paused. Just because you feel like people are trying to control your life, and maybe people are controlling your life, does not mean that you cannot multiply and grow and spread and do what God has called you to do. What the enemy wants us to focus on is on the oppression. That's exactly what the devil wants our focus to be on. He wants us to be so focused on the fear and the oppression that we wind up moving into wanting to control those who are trying to control us. My goodness. If we focus on the very thing that the enemy is wanting us to focus on, let me say this again, we will move into a, a mindset, a frame of mind where we will want to control whoever's trying to control us. This is why we cannot focus on the oppression. We have to focus on His promise and God's purpose for our life. This is so vital because God's still blessed in the midst of oppression. I want to just destroy this myth that I cannot succeed and thrive until COVID-19 is over. I cannot succeed and thrive until this oppression and depression lifts off of me. The very thing that will destroy uh, this oppression, this depression, this attack of the enemy that's harassing you is you focusing on promise and purpose. God's promise, his word, and his purpose for you. And you will break past whatever weightiness and heaviness is on you. But as long as you focus on the heaviness, you will continue to be heavy. As long as you focus on depression, you will continue to be depressed. As long as you focus on sickness, you may continue to be sick. As long as you focus on strife, you'll continue to live in strife. But when you focus on the word and on God's peace and on God's promise and on God's purpose and on God's goodness and on God's faithfulness, you will break past this oppression and this wall that seems so difficult to get past. Come on, they still were blessed in the midst of oppression. They were still blessed. So, the Egyptians worked the people of Israel without mercy. Listen, I want to back up here. It says, the more, so, so it says in verse 12, but the more the Egyptians oppressed them, the more the Israelites multiplied and spread, and the more alarmed the Egyptians became. If you're getting attacked right now, it very well could be because the, you're alarming the enemy. It very well could be that you are alarming the enemy and they're afraid because now you're focusing on purpose instead of the problem. You're focusing on promises instead of what if something negative happens. You're, you're putting your, your focus and your purpose in the right direction. Listen, if you haven't experienced warfare in a minute, you may want to look at what you've been looking at. You may, you may want to analyze, man, am I doing something great for the kingdom? Because I know this, when you step into purpose, the enemy gets threatened. And the enemy's driven by fear. So what do they try to do? They try to control you and I. I've heard before the foundation of hell is fear. So what does the devil try to do? He tries to control. He tries to possess. He tries to manipulate. He tries to distort. He tries to pervert. King Pharaoh was driven by fear, and as a result, he moved into control. But as he moved into control, God still began to multiply. You have to realize God's power is stronger than the devil's power. Listen, don't think, don't think that's just cliche. No, it's the truth. God's power is more stronger than the devil's power. Which one do you believe today? 
Do you believe you're never going to get past this season of your life? You believe you're never going to reach the purpose of God for your life? Because if you do, you're buying into fear, not faith. This is really important. Listen, it goes on to say, So the Egyptians worked the people of Israel without mercy. They made their lives bitter, forcing them to mix mortar and make bricks and do all the work in the fields. They were ruthless in their demands. You ever, you ever feel like, man, when's this warfare going to be over? Man, when's this attack ever going to come to an end? Man, when is this ever going to stop? I, I don't know the answer for you, but I know when you focus on the promise and the, pur- and the purpose that God has for you in his word, there's a heaviness that begins to lift off to you. And even if warfare never stops, even if the attack never stops, the Bible says that God is a shield for us. God is a shield for you and I. So you don't have to worry about if warfare is ever going to stop. Stop focusing on the time frame of when warfare is going to end and start focusing on God's purpose and his promise and his blessing and his goodness and his faithfulness. Draw close to the heart of God and the heart of God will be a shield for you. Draw close to the heart of God and his heart will be a shield for you. Stop focusing on the end times and eschatology and are we post-trib, mid-trib, when is it all going to happen? And, and, and this warfare is just wearing me down. And Oh my goodness, why did the Israelites go into the season uh, of, the, of wilderness for 40 years? Because they complained and didn't believe the Lord. Maybe part of a lot of people's problem is they're complaining about the warfare they're in. Listen, I don't know about you, but if you've ever had kids before, man, whining gets old really quick. Complaining gets old really quick. I can't stand whining. I can't stand fake whining. I can't stand complaining. I can't stay. Mur- I can't stand it. It's. It, I, I, I hate it. I really. I don't hate my kids, but I hate complaining. And I understand now why God put them in the wilderness because of their complaining. Here he. Here he did so. He did miraculous miracles. So many miracles for the Israelites. Man, he sent, he sent Moses, and, 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 and man, and just think about the miracles that took place during this time, the Red Sea parting. Man, think about the, th- think about the plagues that came and how, how the Israelites were protected from the death angel. I mean, you think about the miracles that God did, and yet they still complain. How many miracles has God done for us, but yet we still complain? We still murmur. We still whine. We always think the, the next problem is always the worst. Whatever problem we find ourselves in, now this problem's the worst. And then when God sets us free from that problem, this next problem, oh, now this is the worst. Why do we act this way? Why do we think this way? Because our focus is on the problem, not on the promise. Our focus is on the issue, not on the God who solves the, perp- the, the, the problem. Let's keep going. In verse 15, then Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, gave this order to the Hebrew midwives. Now just type right there, midwives. Midwives. Now men, don't check out right now. I'm not just preaching to women. Mother's Day was last week, okay? I did think though, looking at this, man, this would be a good Mother's Day message. But this is for man and for woman, all right? God created man and woman. Come on, somebody, if you're married, say amen to that. Shaka. Then Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, gave this order to the Hebrew midwives. Now, I, you can do a better job because you're a better theologian than I am at pronouncing these names. But there was two specific midwives that Pharaoh gave this order to. Verse 16, when you help the Hebrew women as they give birth, when you help them as they give birth, watch as they deliver. If the baby is a boy, kill him. If it is a girl, let her live. But because the midwives feared God, but because the midwives feared God, they refused to obey the king's orders. But because the midwives feared God, they they refused to obey the king's orders. They allowed the boys to live. Now, let me give you a definition. Two, Two different definitions of midwife. The first definition I'm going to give is out of the dictionary. It means this, a person trained to assist women in childbirth. All right? That's, that's the first definition. There's two definitions within the dictionary that I'm going to give, and then we're going to give two definitions within the Hebrew, uh, looking at what it means in the Hebrew, the word midwife. So the second definition in the dictionary means a person or thing that produces or aids in producing something new or different. A person or thing that produces or helps 
and producing not just something that's already been, but something that is new and something that is different. My God. A person or thing that produces. See, midwives aren't just there for somebody else to help deliver their baby into the world. God also has a baby he wants to birth through you. He wants to produce through you. We're going we're gonna to dive into something here in just a moment. I, I, I'm like, man, whew. the Hebrew definition is this. To bear, bring forth. To bear, bring forth. To bear, to bring forth. Or another definition is to cause or help to bring forth. Really similar definitions. So what's the word midwife mean in the context of what we're talking about? If you're believing God for a child, man, maybe this is a prophetic word for you to believe that God is going to help you conceive a baby. And if that's you, I just speak that over you in Jesus' name. But in the spiritual aspect, in the spiritual context, what does this mean? This means that God wants to burst something through you and, not or, and this is for every believer, not just that God wants to birth something through you, God wants to use you to help somebody else give birth to something. Come on, the, 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 the word midwife, I just always thought it meant somebody who helps a woman give, give birth, like, like helps, helps them deliver a baby. But when you look at the definition, it's not just about me helping you or you helping somebody else. It's actually God's wanting to birth something through you. Now, knowing that definition... Let's look back at this. The midwives feared God. They refused to obey the king's orders. They allowed the boys to live. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives. Why have you done this, he demanded. Why have you allowed the boys to live? Look at their response. The Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. The midwives replied, pause right here. The Hebrew, the, the Egyptian women and the Hebrew women, they're different. The Hebrew women are different than the Egyptian women. I don't know about you, man, but I just think it's time that the church draw a line in the sand and stand up for righteousness and holiness and really be the church. So that way there's no more, are you a Christian or are you not a Christian? I can't tell by your lifestyle. I can't tell by your language. I can't tell by your social media posts. You say you serve Jesus, but yet uh, your, your actions speak different. The Hebrew Hebrew women were not like the Egyptian women. Can people tell you apart? The Bible says, come out from among them and be separate. There has to be a distinction. It doesn't mean we stand on street corners with turn or burn signs saying turn or burn, or we're calling to people, telling them they're going to hell. That's not the point of being separate. It means there is something on the inside of you. In other words, you're spending time with Jesus. God is transforming you by the power of the Holy Spirit, and there's a light that comes from you that other people see. There's a uniqueness about you. There's something sweet about you. We know it's Jesus, but the world's searching for it. The world's looking for that peace. It's looking for that joy. Come on, the Hebrew women are different than the Egyptian women. The midwives replied, they are more vigorous and have their babies so quickly that we cannot get there in time. Man, they're just popping babies out. They keep popping them babies out, man. God's hand is on them. They keep reproducing. They keep reproducing. They keep re We can't get there. Man, God's doing so much inside of the church right now. Man, we can't. We don't know everything God's doing. The church is reproducing. It's reproducing. It's multiplying. The hand of God is on the church. They're fulfilling their purpose. Come on. Are you getting the picture? Come on. When we come out from the world and actually stand up for righteousness in a humble, pure way, not in an arrogant, I got to get my voice across way. But in a humble, pure, loving way. Not from a foundation of fear where I want to control those who are controlling me. But from a foundation of like, I truly care about people. I truly love people. I truly want to help people. Man, yeah, let's stand up for righteousness. But let's do it in a way that... When the enemy tries to come and put blame on us, they'll find no fault. These Hebrew women were popping babies out, y'all. Just popping babies out. I'm reminded of the, the hippo game or whatever. Comes out of there and you're trying to hit them. You can't, you can't get there fast enough. Come on. Whack-a-mole. We can't get there, Pharaoh. 
Come on. Verse 20, so God, listen to this. God was good to the midwives, and the Israelites continued to multiply, growing more and more powerful. That just debunks the myth that during this time we cannot succeed. This debunks the myth that during this time we have to wait for the government. The government's the thing that's controlling the church right now. And I tell you what, if the government doesn't move, we're just, we're just going to rebel. Are you kidding me? You, you want to rebel against authority because the government's trying to control and I, we have rights and all. Come on, what does that say about the church? What does that say about Romans and in Peter where it talks about submit to authority? Come on. Why are we waiting on the government to remove the oppression? Oppression doesn't come from government. It comes from Satan. We're looking to man and fighting with man weapons, worldly weapons, instead of like spiritual weapons, looking at God's word and and still thriving. Listen, when this whole thing happened, it shook me. Just as your pastor, let me get transparent. It shook me. I tell you, it, it, it threw me in for a spin. And man, God, help me get back to purpose. He helped me get back to my purpose. He helped me refocus and reset. And this has driven me deeper into relationship with the Lord. Listen, the enemy tried to have his way with me and get me so off focus and get me more disconnected from the Lord. But man, what God did during this time was the opposite. But there was a yielding that had to take place. There was a yielding. There was a seizing. There was a stopping, a reevaluating, hanging out in his presence. You can't, be, you can't keep going from zero to 60 and expect that you understand all of God's purpose for your life. Or if you're, if you're, if you're like me and you got thrown a curveball, and I, I just, it wouldn't surprise me if there are people watching right now, you're, in, still, you're still in that frame of mind. We're like, man, I'm still trying to get a grip on purpose. Stop what you're doing. Hang out with God. Don't just hang out with them for, for the sake of getting your purpose. Hang out with them because there's no other place. There's no other place. There's no other place sweet like the presence of God. There's no other place good like the presence of God. There's no other place that's going to protect you and make you feel so confident and secure with who you are and what he's called you to do than like the presence of the Lord. I'm going to keep going. I had a thought, but we're going to keep rolling. God was good to the midwives, and the Israelites continued to multiply and grow more powerful. Verse 21, listen to this. Listen, 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 Linda, listen. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. You want to know a lie of the enemy? A lie of the enemy is this. Can I tell you a lie of the enemy? This is a lie of the enemy. A lie of the enemy is this. If all I do is try to help somebody else fulfill their destiny and purpose, what about me? What about me? I'm working so hard to fulfill the the dream and vision of my boss. I'm working so hard to fulfill the dream and vision of my pastor. I'm working so hard to fulfill the dream and vision of my spouse. What about me, God? (laughs) What about nobody wants me? (laughs) You don't even care about me. You're just using me. I'm just being used. And that's the frame of mind that a lot of people deal with. And so what do they do? They rebel if they're not careful. They'll rebel and they'll go rogue. Nobody sees the goodness of God in me. Nobody sees the gifts and the calls and the talents on the inside of me. So I need to go make something happen myself. Why? Because of insecurity? Maybe because of a spirit of rejection? Because of fear? They feel like they're not going to reach their purpose? So what do they do? I'm going to go make it happen myself. You know, I've invested in my spouse long enough. Now it's my turn to rise up. Hold on. You know what? Nobody in my church sees the gifts and talents and the anointing in my life. Let me go do my own thing. Let me, let me go start my own ministry. Let me go start this. And what do we do? We create an Ishmael, and that brings the vision between the promise. Whatever you start, you've got to keep churning. Whatever you start, it's on you to make it happen. But if you wait for God's timing... He'll give you a family. He'll help you reach your purpose. And there'll be such a sweet grace on your life, you'll be so thankful that you waited. You'll be so thankful that you waited. There's a verse in James chapter 3, verse 16. 
And this verse is a pretty strong verse. It says this, New Living Translation, For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, for wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, jealousy and selfish, are you listening? Jealousy and selfish ambition. I'm going to do this on my own. God, you're taking too long. Nobody recognizes me. Nobody, listen to me. You know what very well could be the root of that feeling? Is the spirit of rejection. It could very well be the spirit of rejection. What's the opposite of rejection? It's, it, it's acceptance. What's the root of acceptance? True, pure acceptance. God's love. When you step into God's love, when you allow his love to permeate your soul and your mind, you're so secure. See, the bullseye of, of, of rest the bullseye or a bullseye of rest is God's love. And when you are content, like when you step into God's love, if you will, you step into rest. And when you step into rest, the fight in you to be recognized, it goes. You don't care who recognizes you. You don't care how many views you get. You don't care how many likes you get. You don't care who calls you or who texts you or who doesn't. All of that is irrelevant at that point. It's like, man, God, I'm just good with you and me. I'm just good with you and me, Lord. All that matters is acceptance from you. Whether your dad or mom praise you, whether, whether people praise you, whether your spouse praises you, whether your kids praise you or not and tell you how great of a parent you are or not, it's irrelevant. You're just good with God's love, and it's in the center of his love that you discover your identity. What does that mean? It means you're good with God, and God's good with you. It means that in the center of that, you'll find your purpose, and you find fulfillment. And whether you ever see the, all the promises that God's promised you come to pass or not, you're okay with it because God's got you. God's got you. Where there's jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. Disorder. And evil of, listen to this church, disorder and evil of every kind. My goodness. If you ever find yourself dealing with sin that you thought you overcame, it could be because there's jealousy and selfish, selfish ambition in your heart again. It, it doesn't mean that God didn't deliver you. God did set you free, but because of jealousy and selfish ambition, that opened the door now to a sin addiction again. It doesn't mean God's okay with it. It means that there's chances are an open door in your life. Pride is why Satan got kicked out of heaven. Selfish ambition, the root of that is pride. This is really important to understand. Jealousy, selfish ambition creates disorder and evil of every kind. If your home's out of order, you need to look, is there pride in your life? Is there pride in your life? Disorder, chaos, confusion, lack of clarity. Is there jealousy in your life? Are you jealous that God's using somebody else more than he's using you? Are you jealous that God is touching somebody else more than you, more than you feel like he's touching you? Are you jealous that you're not getting recognition? This is opening the door for, for evil, the Bible says, of every kind. That means any demon in hell can come now and bring havoc into your home. Evil of every kind. Perversion. Come on. I'm not going to list them all. I'm not even sure I know them all. But, man, evil of every kind just flooding your heart, flooding your home. Why? Because of jealousy. Because of jealousy. I got good news for you. I got good news for you. When you are content with God's love, that's where you find true satisfaction. When you find yourself being content, and I'm, I, I, I'm even hesitant to use that word content because in God's love, man, it's just, man, there's fullness of joy. It's, it's, you're fully satisfied. You don't need recognition. Here's the thing about the midwives. Where are they? I, I, I'm talking to you right now. Where are you? You're, you're called to be a midwife. You're called to be a midwife. You're called 
You're called to help somebody give birth to a move of the Holy Spirit. You're, you're called to help somebody identify their purpose. You're called to help somebody step into their God-given design. That's what you, man, think about that. God spoke to me one time. He said, would you be okay? Would you, if I got this right, he said, would you be okay with being the guy who led Billy Graham to the Lord and not being Billy Graham? Like, like, like being as, as, as popular and, and being as influential as Billy Graham was. And I, I want to ask you that same question. Are you okay with being the guy that, I don't even know if you know the guy's name that led Billy Graham to the Lord. See, that's the thing. The guy who led Billy Graham to the Lord, I don't know his name, but everybody knows Billy Graham. Come on, there's other great men and women of God out there that, that we could put in place of Billy Graham. Would you be okay with being that person? Man, can you imagine, can you imagine just, just how awesome it is for, like, like, if you were to be that guy that led Billy Graham to the Lord, can you imagine just, just how, who knows how big of a mansion this guy has in heaven? Who knows how blessed this guy is in heaven right now? See, a lot of people want to be the, the show. They want to be the event. They want to be the thing. Man, are we okay with being the midwife who helps a Billy Graham, who helps a Kim Clement, who helps somebody well-known step into their God-given design? You know what's crazy? There's so many Hebrew women that gave birth to kids. The Bible, I'm, wouldn't surprise me, doesn't list all their names. But you know the names that did get listed? Two midwives. Two midwives. And you know what's really cool about these midwives? Because they feared the Lord, they didn't kill these boys. God wanted up blessing them with families of their own. They were focused on the assignment at hand. They were focused on what God's called them to link up with these Hebrew women, help them give birth to healthy children, pour into them, be there for them. When they're starting to go into labor, show up, be there. Don't be one that says, well, I don't get recognized. What about me? No, 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 no. Listen, if you fear the Lord, because this is what happens. When we allow jealousy to come in, listen to me. When we allow jealousy to come in, we become like Pharaoh. He said, kill all the boys. When we allow jealousy and selfish ambition to come in, what do we do? If we're not there to help somebody give birth, what if that purpose, that design, that individual, that human being, what if God's counting on us to be there to help them step into it? And what if because we're so focused on us that it prolongs what God's wanting to do in them? What if jealousy winds up aborting what God wants to do in you? Selfish ambition aborts what God wants to do in us. Listen to me. God, help my heart be whether I have a family of my own or whether you just want me to help others find their purpose. Help me be good with either one. Help me be content and satisfied. That needs to be the prayer of our heart today. Where are the midwives? Who's a midwife? Every believer, every brother, every sister in Christ. God wants to burst something through you, but he also wants you to help somebody give birth to something. The families did not come to the midwives until after they helped Hebrew women give birth to their babies. Maybe that, that purpose, that design that you need clarity on, maybe you do have clarity, but God hasn't opened the door yet. Maybe God's waiting on you to humble yourself and link arms with a pure heart with somebody that he's called you to link arms with and help give birth to this move of God on the inside of them. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, your presence is here. Where are the midwives? Where are the midwives? That's just that's stirring in my spirit. Where are the midwives? Where are the midwives? God, there's even people out there who don't, they, they're Christians, Lord, but they don't, they don't care about the purpose of God for their life. God, there's so many people content 
working their nine to five. They're not, they're not pursuing you to search out their purpose. God, there's some who don't want to help other people discover their design. Holy Spirit, I'm asking that you bring an awakening to the church. Holy Spirit, I'm asking you that you will stir Oasis Church cattle meals to wake up, to stop sleeping spiritually, to stop coasting. Start with this house, Lord. Bring conviction to this place. Awaken our hearts, God. Help us realize that you've called us to be a midwife in a time such as this. God, you have anointed and you have appointed Oasis Church for such a time as this to step up and be a midwife, to help other people discover their purpose and their design. And as a result, you will help us discover our purpose and our design. But what's interesting, within being a midwife, we have discovered purpose. We have discovered our design, and that is being a midwife. Lord, help us awaken our heart. God, open the eyes of our heart. Open the ears of our heart. God, give people visions and dreams. Stir their heart. I pray for a fresh fire to hit them wherever they are. A fresh zeal and passion for you, God. Where are the midwives? I hear God saying, where are the midwives? Just like Adam and Eve. Adam, where are you? He's saying, midwife, where are you? Why are you hiding? Come out of hiding. Come out of the spirit of rejection. Come out of jealousy. Come out of pride. Unclothe yourself again. Get transparent and naked before me. Like we used to have those moments in those times. saying he won't turn away from you when you get transparent somebody's dealing with shame you're afraid God's going to reject you the way your dad rejected you somebody listening right now you got transparent before your dad you got humble before him you begin to share how you feel and your dad your dad didn't listen to your heart your dad rejected you in that moment at least you felt rejection and as a result, you struggle going to your heavenly father with those same feelings and desires. Maybe it's something new. God won't shame you when you go to him. I'm reminded of that a midwife is, is here to produce and to help somebody else give birth to something that's new and different. Church, if we do not get on the Holy Spirit's wavelength, we'll miss out on what God's wanting to do. He's wanting to do something new, and he's wanting to do something different. Something new and something different. God, help us be flexible. Upgrade our hard drive. I hear the Lord saying he's wanting to upgrade your hard drive to get in sync so that you can begin to operate with his operating system. If you know anything about computers, I upgraded my computer just the other day. And one of the apps I had on my computer is no longer work with the upgrade. And I hear the Lord saying, you are in a time right now where you can, you choose to upgrade. You can, you have the decision that we have to make. He's given us the decision. He's empowered us to make the choice to upgrade Holy Spirit will upgrade our hardware to where we can operate with the Father. If we choose not to, He will not pour new wine into an old wineskin. God, I don't want to miss out on what you're wanting to do. I don't want to miss out on who you're wanting to reach. I see, I see men and women with tattoos. I see people who smell like alcohol and cigarettes. I see people who have the, who smell like the hint of weed on them. 
people who who struggle financially. People who look like they need a shower. I even see a wealthy person coming who's just so broken and empty. So broken, so empty. They don't care about money. Money money didn't solve their problems. They're just so desperate. People that we would not expect to come to the Lord, God is wanting to bring them to Him. And He's wanting to use you and I. The people we thought, oh no, or the people that we just ignored, or the people we thought to ourselves, oh, we've already tried. God says, try again. God says, try again. I hear the Lord saying, try again. Try again. This is for somebody says, try again. Do not give up on them. Do not give up on them. Do not give up on them. Try again. Try again. Try again. Try again. I see somebody dealing with a waist issue. You're in pain in your waist. You're in pain in your waist. I speak healing over that waist. Over the waist. It may be, it may hurt when you try to turn. When you try to when you try to when you try to pivot in your waist. You try to turn. I speak healing over that waist right now in Jesus' name. God, I thank you that you've called Oasis Church Cattle Mills to be a midwife for Hunt County. You've called Oasis Church Cattle Mills to be a midwife for this county. Jesus. To help this county recognize its potential. To help this county recognize what, what your purposes are for this county. God, what you have in store is bigger than just for this house. It's for Hunt County. It's 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 for Hunt. And I hear the Lord saying, as we continue to step into his purpose for Oasis Church Cattle Mills to help Hunt County discover its purpose, that God will birth something, that God will God will birth something through. Well. He will burst something through us, but if I remember correctly, what I heard was that he will use Hunt County to bless this house. He'll use Hunt County to bless this house. I was just going to roll with the first, but I want to say what I hear the Lord say. Father, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you that the midwives are awakening. Jealousy is leaving. I come against the demon of pride in people's lives. I come against the demon of fear in people's lives. I come against the demon of jealousy, the demon of rejection. And I speak, Father, for your love to permeate their hearts. Because it's in your love that we find true acceptance. And I thank you that midwives are awakening right now mindsets are being broken in Jesus' name. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen. Listen to me. You're a midwife. God's got purpose for you, but he also, part of his purpose for you is to help somebody discover their purpose and their design. To find the God-given gold on the inside of them. I challenge you to do that this week. Encourage somebody, love on somebody, pull the gold out of them. Be a midwife. Watch God do something amazing for you, amazing for your family. He'll give you purpose of your own. He has purpose for you, but he'll unveil it for you, and it'll be awesome. Trust the Lord. He's got you. We love you, church. We hope to be together soon. Kelly's going to come, our MC. She's going to close us up. Wow, wow, wow. Well, before we let you go from that powerful, powerful, God-breathed word, I want to tell you this. Go back and watch that message again this week. And then share it with someone else because it is our responsibility as children of God to strengthen our team, right? We're a team. 
And this word is so timely, and it is just what the church needs to hear today. Hey, if it's your first time joining us, we have a connect card you can fill out on this Facebook post. We'd love for you to connect with us. If you need prayer, reach out. We want to be in this with you together. Keep watching our Facebook page for updates on what's going on here at Oasis. We love you guys. Give. You can give online still through our app. Until we get to see you again, be in Oasis wherever you are. <laughs>